Thanks. My name is Ed Reisinger. I am the chairman of the Land Use and Transportation Committee for the Baltimore City Council. I welcome you tonight at this hearing. We are here this evening to conduct the fourth of seven public hearings in the community on City Council Bill 12-0152, Transform Baltimore Zoning. Today's hearing will address titles 13, 16, and 17, which are plan unit developments, off-street parking and loading, and also uh, signs. This comprehensive zoning code rewrite is a very important time to learn about the general public's land use and zoning priorities. We, the committee, want to hear from as many of our constituents as possible. The Baltimore Poly family has graciously allowed us to use this facility to conduct today's hearing. However, we must vacate the facilities by 9 p.m. We would like to thank the administrative team and the entire Polly family for hosting us this evening. Every hearing is open to the public testimony and citizens may come and provide testimony at each public hearing. The following guidelines, however, will be enforced today and throughout this process. Persons wishing to offer all testimony must sign in and state their name, their address or community in which they reside and who they represent for the record. Individual offering testimony will be limited to a single three minutes presentation. The screen behind me will assist you with keeping track of your time. If multiple people from an organization or affiliated group are present, one representative should be designated to speak on behalf of that organization or group. Individuals may not sign in to testify and then yield their time to another presenter. As stated previously, all individuals will be permitted to testify only once. If the individual has points they wish to raise that cannot be addressed in the allotted three minute time period, they can submit written testimony to committee staff at the hearing. If you would like to attend a hearing to testify about a part of the zoning code ordinance other than the section the committee intends to study during this hearing, you may do so and your testimony will be taken during the hearing. If you wish to provide written testimony, please merit to the Office of Council Services attention to Antoine Banks at 100 North Holiday Street, Baltimore, Maryland at 21202 or email at antoine.banks at baltimorecity.gov. Um, we have some ground rules. Uh, my favorite ground rule is if you could please but I request to turn off your cell phones, uh, smartphones, Androids, to give courtesy and respect to those who are going to testify. And uh, the planning department will provide us with a report which includes a PowerPoint presentation. What we ask is no questions uh, until they finish the uh, presentation. After the presentation, all council members uh, and attendants can ask two questions. Um, after, after the questions from the council members, we will hear from the uh, constituents. And as I said, it's a total of three minutes. I would like to acknowledge we have from the mayor's office, we have uh, Andy Smallin, for mayor St representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake. And also we have Angela Gibson, who's here representing Mayor Stephanie Rollins-Blake. Um, the uh, president, uh, Bernard Jack Young, had a prior commitment, but if he can get away, he'll, he'll be here but he's represented by Kara Kuntz, also by Michelle Worsberger, and also by um, Aaron Rowe. Um, at this time, we will have the planning department come up and, and uh, give the presentation. Good evening, thank you, members of the council. Um, I'm gonna be pointing to change the slides tonight, uh, so bear with me on that. Yeah. Uh, my, my apologies. Um, well, also, I want to acknowledge oh. my council members, which I forgot. It's uh, Councilman Bob Curran to my far left. To his right, Karen, Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. To her right is Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. To my left is Councilman Jim Kraft, who is also the vice chair of the committee. To my far right is Councilman Bill Henry. To his left is Councilman Brandon Scott. Uh, Councilman Scott's left is Councilman Ricky Spector, the Dean of the of the Council. Also, we are joined by um, 
uh, Larry Green, the Director of Councilmatic Services, and to my right is a staff person to the Land Use and Transportation Committee, uh, Mr. Antoine Banks. Go ahead. Thank you. And uh, for anybody in the audience that wants any assistance with the maps, they're out in the hall, and there's planning staff available if you have questions about those. Um, quickly, um, the zoning code it, are the re regulations placed on parcels of land and how they can be developed. And they are intended to protect the health, safety, and welfare of our citizens. Our current code uh, zoning in Baltimore dates to 1923, and our current code is 1971. Uh, and they are um, what the first step in determining what can be built on the property, what types of uses, and size of building. The zoning code does not distinguish between good and bad businesses, nor does it determine human behavior. And as I mentioned, the last comprehensive update was 1971. The city has changed dramatically in that time, especially in business and industry. We were very much heavy manufacturing and um, very much uh, separation of uses, the sort of mixed use had not really started then. Our comprehensive plan in 2006 recommended the new code, live, earn, play, learn. And the goals were to, of the new code, to support and guide development and investment, enhance and protect neighborhood character, strengthen retail districts, and promote job growth. And to make the code that's understandable, predictable, and enforceable. These are the, the principles that were used in drafting the code. And tonight we were asked to focus on titles 13, 16, and 17. So I will go into those briefly. This is the table of contents for the entire code and just highlighting those titles. Um, planned unit developments, parking and loading, and signs. Okay, starting with planned unit developments, this is an ordinance and they, they are a ordinance that can only be established by the city council and it allows a variance in the underlying district regulations to, um, with goals to look at a master plan uh, to protect the site, to create uh, a more creative uh, site design, building design, protect natural features, um, and it must provide similar protection um, and give some flexibility from the underlying zoning in exchange for uh, some benefits to the community, whether it's an open space or other things. So the zoning basically stands and then the planned unit development is an overlay that can vary that. Um, I want to, for a minute, talk about transition rules because in there are currently planned unit developments in our code. We have about 150 of them around the city. Many of them are very, very outdated and others are very active. Um, so this title also talks about transition rules from existing planned unit developments into the new code. The existing ones remain valid unless they are removed by the council and all the requirements remain in them. Amendments um, would be categorized, amendments to an existing plan unit development would be categorized under the new code, which has three categories, three clearly stated categories, and I'll go into detail on those in a minute. But they break down into engineering changes, minor changes, or major changes. And permitted use, permitted and conditional uses of the underlying zoning of this new code would be permitted in existing plan unit developments unless that use is specifically prohibited. Uh, so to establish a planned unit development, this would be the basic process that there's an application and a planning commission review and then it goes to the city council for introduction. Um, the purpose of the planning commission review is to get public input and to have hearings on that preliminary development and design. And then it goes to the council, which again has a series of public hearings as they do on the planning, um, planned unit developments today. And of course, the arrow is there to note because at any time the council could choose to introduce ahead of that process 
and then it would still go down through the Planning Commission reviews. So it really, the council can introduce their bill at either point, and it still goes through the same Planning Commission hearings. Um, once the council approves a plan, then it's subject to any final development plan approval by the Planning Commission and Director of Planning to make sure what is submitted conforms to what the council approved. So when there's actual building design, that has to be checked in public hearing to make sure it is consistent with what was approved. Modifications can happen three ways in a planned unit development. Engineering changes, and that would be unforeseen circumstances based on site conditions. Um, and those can be approved by the Director of Planning, again, subject to appeal to the Planning Commission. Um, now I want to jump to minor modifications and major modifications and then go back to minor modifications. Major modifications in this code for planned unit developments would be any increase of more than 10% or a decrease of 25% in dwelling units any change in building height over stated maximum, significant change in type, location, arrangement of land uses within the development, any change in boundary, decrease in open space that has been included as a public benefit, and any change that would violate the underlying zoning or approved exception in the, in the plan. Any of these things would automatically need to go back to the City Council for amendment Anything less than that would be subject to minor modification, which would be subject to Planning Commission approval in public hearing. And so I think that's the, the better way to explain it. In the current code, just by contrast, there are no provisions for engineering changes, and major versus minor modifications are not clearly defined in the current code. So we attempted to define those and make them clear. Also, new in this code, under the current code, planned unit developments have no time limits. They never expire, and they never go away unless removed. And we've had a number of problems with that throughout the city where a planned unit development is established, circumstances wholly change, and it's still in place. Um, so under this code, a planned unit development has time limits that can be put into the plan, and then once the plan is approved by the City Council and the final development is approved, um, then it has to be started within two years of that approval. The Planning Commission may extend the time, again in public hearing, but they must consider hardship and circumstances and the likelihood of it moving forward. In addition, um, there are provisions in this code for cancellation of a planned unit development by the zoning administrator for noncompliance. Okay. Um, I'd like to point to some of the major amendments in Title 13 that the Planning Commission approved at their September 19th meeting. And this was done with the assistance of the, the Law Department and that is in section 13301 and 302 to clarify the council's role of introducing the PUD. Yes, the council introduces the plan unit development. Uh, law felt that wasn't as clearly stated as it could have been, though it was there. So we've, um, language has been added to change that. Also for clarification, law department suggested that the term master plan be used instead of preliminary plan to better reflect that that plan does go to the city council. And then the second action is just the final design approval, which separates out the planning commission action. And um, to clarify that the commission may approve phasing changes or the, the modifications um, as a minor piece. That was something they approved. Um, I'll go on to Title 16. We're going to I should have said this earlier, my apology. What we're going to do is we're going to ask questions in regards to, oh, okay. to the PUD, to um, Article 13, and then after we finish with Article 13, the PUD, then we'll, then we'll go ahead and you can give the presentations 
with 16 and 17. Okay, okay I'd, I'd like to note that from the law department, we have Hillary Ruley and parking authorities also represented tonight because of Title 16. So, okay. for questions. Yeah, go ahead. You can give your report. Okay. Then we'll go with the uh, planning department. Um, Hillary, Hillary Ruley from the law department. Um, just with respect to Title 13, we've worked with the planning department to address a lot of the concerns about the language in there, as Laurie said, and obviously we'll work with you to address any changes you want to make, but we wanted to be clear that, you know, while it can be beneficial to have the process start at planning, because they can do a lot of the legwork and developers get more guidance, um, essentially I'm shorthanding it, um, obviously that can't take away your legislative authority, so if you want to start a PUD off on your own. We wanted to make sure the code was clear that you guys can do that introduction as well. So um, it's up, you know, that's always possible. So we wanted that to be clear. And, um, you know, Victor worked a lot in our office on the, the Title 13 um, changes. So if there are questions you have or changes you want to that, I mean, we're certainly willing to work with you on that. Um, and uh, Victor, <laughs> throwing him under the bus. He was the one that did a lot of that, so um, he's probably the best one to contact for that. I did more the signs and stuff, but um, you know, we're certainly willing to work with you. And just to reassure people, I mean, the PUDs exist. They have to, by law, continue to exist. So even though the zoning code is changing, if you're interested in a PUD issue, um, it can't just simply take your PUDs away. And so they all exist under the, the transition rules, make it clear they all exist with the exact same rules that apply, apply to them now, um, and that doesn't change. Any new PUDs enacted would have um, the things Laurie talked about um, in terms of, um, you know, expiration, things like that. And then, um, obviously, if, if the council wants to repeal any of them, the new or the old, they, they are always free to do that. So um, we're willing to work with you and help you on whatever changes you have to the, to the PUD section. Okay. Hillary. Um, well, Hillary, my question is, is that um, where is where is uh, is, he, uh, is he? He's not here. Tonight? Victor, no, Victor. he's we've um, we right. Um, he's at a, um, he covered a couple of the other ones, so we've split split up these evening hearings. But um, um, I know fairly well the changes and the amendments are. We've worked through planning, so they are the planning and law department amendments. They're already in that major amendment sheet that came after this went through the planning commission. So we worked with them and that's now planning and us are, are on board with those that clarification language. But obviously anything the council wants to do, we're happy to work with you guys. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It's just that um, at every hearing, what disturbs me, in my opinion, is there's a different representative from the law department. Right. So, I, I, unfortunately, we don't, any one of us, have the capacity to go through this with a fine-tooth comb on our own, so we divided up the titles. And because signs is tonight, that's mine, but, yeah. I mean, I can answer pretty much any question you'd have on Title 13. But if you go back and look at the material and find you have something else and you want to call us, you know, if you call me, I'll, I'll direct you more to Victor because he knows that better. But I can still answer any questions you've got. Okay. Uh, Councilman... Councilman, I think it was Councilman Henry and Councilman Kraft. Do you have regards to the? Oh, yeah. It's just being recorded. Okay. I can be loud. Right, exactly. It's not, not that loud. <laughs> yes, I can be heard in people's homes even without the uh, aid of the microphone. Um, good evening. Hello. Um, working backwards, quote, the council is free to repeal or amend PUDs. Yep. Do we need the request or permission of the owner first? Nope. Really? Yeah. Well, well, it's your legislation. Right. You don't, it's your I, legislation. You can always, you can't bind your own future hands on any legislation. I, I had been told in the past that I could not offer an amendment to a PUD without it being at the request of the owner. Well, I mean, there are some caveats to the amendment issue, but for the repeal, there isn't um, because what you have is a land use thing so you're not just simply sitting as a regular legislative body when you do land use work if it affects a person's individual property they now have a property right that they're entitled to so they have to come and and have certain um, due process rights that are preserved for them so it gets a little tricky with amendment but ultimately the general rule for legislation is y you make it you 
but you're so, elected, so you can take it away. Yeah. So I could just repeal a PUD, or I could I could introduce a bill to repeal a PUD. Right, and if any part of that, now remember, lots of PUDs have both, um, they have a lot of different things in them. Some of them are land use restrictions. Some of them, you know, modify the kinds of uses that the person can use on that land. And some of them um, go towards uh, condemnation authority. So, not in a PUD, or, oh, sorry, that's more of the URs. Um, but in a PUD, they have, you know, they have a wide range of things. And so if you repeal the PUD, you know, the restriction on the repeal or the amendment will go to whether or not the person's due process rights were affected. So it just depends. Like, for example, if I've always been X store and uh, you repeal my PUD and now I am no longer legally able to be X store, um, which is tough to do. Be, it's kind of a tricky example because, of course, you know, they would under this current code and under the new code, they always be non-conforming. But just take, for example, let's say a PUD says you can do you know, eight possible uses here. And um, they've been use number one, but then you repeal the PUD and now the use number two that they'd like to be is no longer allowed under the current zoning. You know, they have an argument for a taking and it all depends on how far they had gotten towards being use number two. If they'd already erected the building and gotten their permits and blah, 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 and then you repeal their PUD, they have a takings argument but you don't have any vested right in your own zoning. You guys have the ability to rezone people's property without a vested property right. It just, you know, so it's gonna be basically case by case. You know, how far did that person have a property interest in that PUD? So the previous advice was probably because, you know, that they had a vested property interest. So it just depends on their, their property rights. Okay, um, so. my, my other question was for oh, Lori. Um, I'm looking at the slide for Title 13 PUD process um, where it says under 3A Planning Commission public hearing prior to City Council introduction, does that mean it would not need to go back to Planning Commission for a report, an agency report, after introduction? As it's written, it would only need to go back for review of any changes the Council may make. So if the Council makes changes, <coughs> Why? Then it would go back. I mean, right now, if right now the order we have it is a PUD gets introduced, it goes to Planning Commission for a report, Planning Commission makes a report, it comes to Land Use Committee, Land Use Committee amendments might happen, it doesn't go back to Planning Commission. Why would it have to go back to Planning Commission in the new code? Because it's a bill at that point, and the bill would typically be referred to Planning Commission. That's the recommendation. Okay. Just a recommendation. It's just a recommendation. Okay. Um, and the second, on also following that, C, if introduced, city council approves or denies. Like, oh, I should have added amends. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the last one on the next page, Title 13, PUD modifications. Yes. For the difference between minor and major modifications. Now, just let me make sure I'm following this. With minor modifications, the Planning Commission can just decide those on their own. In a public hearing, In yes. a public hearing, right. Um, in major modifications, it would have to come to the council as legislation. Correct. Um, but if it came to the council as legislation, it would still go to the Planning Commission as for, a referral. As a referral. So if it's going to go to the Planning Commission either way, why should the Planning Commission be making the decision over whether it's major or minor. Wouldn't it make more sense for the council to decide it's not big enough for us to have to deal with it, so it should just go to planning commission? Um, this is based on the way it's done now, and um, I think it's also a matter of timing, and you know we believe that it's reasonable in terms of a developer's timetable that if it's a minor amendment, you know, we don't want to hold it up for three to six months if they're taking a story off a building or that sort of thing. But if it is really actually minor, then why would it take three to six months for the council to say, we don't want to rule on it, you can just send this to Planning Commission? Usually with the notice and the hearings of a bill, that's the time but period. Won't Planning Commission have to do notice and hearings? But we don't. We wouldn't be writing a bill. We we do our. We would be doing it within two weeks, two to three weeks, typically. Do we have? Is, is there is there any kind of mechanism under which we can just? 
make a decision make a decision without a bill this is captain this is a recommendation at this and at the board says that we can the council as hillary said we can do what we want to do the babies are now all the now yeah yeah let's not put the baby in our court okay okay all right thank you Councilman Kraft, my um, right now mine are more in the nature of comments for you all to think about to discuss in the work session. Um, number one is with regard to the law department and your comment that there are a lot of sections here and there are a lot of things and you need a lot of different lawyers. Yes. And um, I think um, you weren't here, the, I don't think you were here last time. No, but I talked to Victor about um, your own council issue, if that's where you're going. So, I mean, I'm certainly well aware of that. Right. And, you know, you have multiple lawyers and we have none. Well, you're certainly free to hire an attorney. Michelle, I believe, is an attorney. You can certainly get legal advice from anybody. Well, if you're telling us we have the money to hire an attorney? I'm not talking about money, but you're certainly free to Well, how to do we hire, hire an attorney if we don't have money? Right. Well, that would be a budget issue, but in terms of this hearing for land use, to keep it at a land use topic, there's nothing that prevents you from getting advice from from um, you know from attorneys that are either on, are, that are on your staff. We certainly wouldn't have our any staff, issue our with that. Staff? We have an attorney. And also, I would like to say, we, our we, door our door is open. I haven't gotten a call from you, and no. none of us have, but you walk down and we're willing to help you on anything you need. Well, we've been down, yeah, we've been down that, yeah, we don't want to have that debate here tonight. All I'm saying is I'm just raising it as a concern. Sure. Um, the other issue I want to raise a concern, and, and this is, uh, again, that was referenced in both about the council may do this and the council can do this, and if the council wants to do this, you know, we're the folks that are elected. I mean, the Planning Commission is not elected except for one member who sits right here with us on this committee. But the rest of those folks aren't elected. The staff isn't elected. We're the people that are elected to make these decisions. Um, you know, they're going to do all this work and they're going to send it to us to introduce a bill and then we're going to work on it and send it back for them to make decisions about it. I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. Um, you know, we introduce the legislation, we come up with it, and then they're, you know, they're staff to us. We're not staff to them. Right. And as you know, currently, when they make a recommendation, you guys are free to disregard it. That, and we do. It's the exact same thing. On occasion. But, but you know, the way that the, there's so much of this is written that, you know, it's like we may do this or we may do that. That's uh, usually a legal tool for a well, permissive. Well, I know policy. what it is. So. I know what it is, but um, you know, the purpose of this zoning code is not to take away the, the, the power of the city council over land use decisions in the city of Baltimore and turn them over to the planning commission or the planning department. And I think you ought to know that um, you know, as we look at this, that is not our intention. So when you're making these presentations and you're looking at all this language, um, you know, be prepared to discuss how we're going to change it so that, you know, we continue to have the authority to make zoning decisions for the citizens of the city of Baltimore and because they elect us to do it and they don't elect the planning department. That's the law department's amendment was actually to that, to the planning commission originally. We wanted to make sure we clarified the language so that that point was captured, you know, because that's, you're the legislative body. In more than one space. Yeah. Council, Councilwoman Clark and then Councilwoman Spector and then Councilman Curran. Thank you very, whoops. Thank you very much. Can, okay. Um, let, let me say that I'd like to quote a line from this HUD um, ch title, and it's on page uh, 207, and it, and it begins on line nine. This is after this is after we have gone through pages upon pages of the four separate reviews that planning will do on a proposed HUD 
four different review processes that can, people can be called back to complete and redo. And at the end of that, plan approval procedure, city council. I'll just read you the first line. After the city council receives the planning commission's recommendation, the preliminary development plan, it's still preliminary after five years and four phases of going through planning and not seeing the light of the city council. The preliminary development plan may be, may be introduced into the city council. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I've sat and listened to attorneys and I'm thinking about attorneys who aren't in this room right now or in this process. There'll be an opinion that says we can't touch it. And, and that's what we were then. afraid of. So we made a drastic amendment to this section that you're not reading from to preserve all these things for okay. you. And so and there's amendments that I believe um, that you guys have had. That was our major concern as the law department. We didn't think it was clear enough that your it legislative is. authority was preserved, so we gutted the section and rewrote it an almost entirely um, to really um, preserve, as Laurie said, that uh, intent, that you are the legislative body, you have the power, and we want to make that clear. So that was and, our um, and I'm intended amendment. an amendment tonight that I would presume you would find suitable I think it's um, actually it says, already been done. It, no, it's not done till we do it. Right. I'm saying it's been a proposed now, amendment. I understand. Right. There are 500 proposed amendments. I have to, as a council person, go back to. I'm not Hillary. Right. I'm not. I'm not trying to give you. A hard no, time. I just didn't want to. You know, or I just anyone. wanted to let you know we share there those are concerns. Five, 500 amendments. I have to do my work on the first reader copy, as always, and someday we'll get to those amendments. But it's our job to come up with amendments because that's our job. And then we may or may not adopt, okay? So I've got one that makes it clear. I've got one that cuts out all those preliminary procedures, pages of them, and I also have one that makes it clear that amendments to the PUD have to be through city council. Right. And then finally, I wanted to say, so this is a statement I'm using instead of a question, about minor changes. This is a big issue in a nearby council district of mine where I happen to represent a pile of the people concerned. So, amend to delete the minor changes section. Substitute, the zoning administrator may approve a change to a final planned unit development plan that, one, is limited to design features and interior planning, B, does not include any increases or decreases to approve density or bulk requirements within the PUD, and C, is not um, in major changes governed by blah, blah. Now. The next section of that says, two, the zoning administrator may determine what constitute a minor modification for purposes of this subsection, and upon appeal of his decision, must refer the issue for a hearing, which stays the decision to the Board of Municipal and Zoning Appeals. So I, I, with all, I, I agree with the intention of my colleague from the fourth. I think there needs to be an administrative body that makes the decision bec and that there should be an appeal of that decision, what's minor, what's major, directly to the zoning board and that the decision's effect is stayed until the, at least the zoning board has a chance to review. So I've used my time with, with a couple statements, but thank you for putting up with that. Yeah, and we're happy to work with you. Victor is yeah, great I'll, at that. Yeah, and I'll yeah. be glad to. Sure. Thank, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, on the part time limits and enforcement, if nothing happens in two years and there's no do good reason and all that good stuff, the only question I have is, 
where there's a cancellation of a PUD, um, the zoning administrator must provide the owner a 15-day notice to answer any charge of noncompliance. The, the uh, cancellation is in a separate section than the expiration by time limit. Sorry, they were on the same slide. Yeah. But the cancellation is due to noncompliance. Right. So in other words, if somebody violates, it's like a zoning right. violation. Right. It's not like so that's a separate item than an expiration. I understand that, but it's not like an urban renewal sunsets. PUDs don't sunset. What what would be the um, No, the proposal is that they would sunset if they're not enacted on. They would sunset. But right. then it but does the zoning administrator make a decision on no. a charge? No. That's the what I zoning administrator makes a decision on noncompliance, two separate issues, and not enacting it versus noncompliance. Okay, noncompliance. So the zoning administrator, is that how it's done now? Yes. If and you are in violation of a PUD, yeah. the zoning administrator is the enforcement entity. He must issue a violation notice that is a zoning violation. And, and a charge, is it, there's a fee? That he imposes. It's not the fee. It's that it's he may the, charge. charge. Of non, he makes the charge of noncompliance. You can appeal that to the board, but ultimately, if he prevails, the, there can be a cancellation of the pot. I misunderstood. I thought yeah. that was a not fee. Not a monetary fee. Sorry. Okay. Councilman Kern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for conducting these hearings throughout the uh, the city. Um, this is the first one. I'm a. I'm a Tending because I have some interest in the PUDs and the, um, the signs. Um, let me get clarification here. The underlying zoning or the PUD, which trumps? The PUD trumps the underlying zoning? The PUD trumps. The underlying zoning. Right. As it is today. Okay. As it is today. As the is, PUDs, yeah. What right. about in the future under the bill? Well, under the, under the bill, that would be the same case. Your PUD would still continue, mm -hmm. and there are transition rules in the front. I think it's section one mm -hmm. um, that tra shows two that shows you um, exactly how to apply the rules. But essentially, mm -hmm. it's to preserve exactly as the PUD is now. Right. It would exist exactly the same way in the future after the new zoning code. Now, I appreciate my colleagues, and I'll be joining them to keep the PUD process with the city council. But I'm going to stray off message here a little bit. Where does urban renewal fit into this plans, URPs? Um, anything with urban renewal would be a separate legislative action. Right. Um, we have in drafting, it was back at the beginning, the drafting principles in drafting this code, we have kept in mind many of the provisions that are common in our urban renewal plans and rolled them into the zoning into code. Into the transform bottom line. Yes. So that as urban renewal plans expire, there the protections are there from many of those plans. Um, lots of them are expiring, and in some cases, we've been some have been um, removed by removed. ordinance as well. Can urban renewal plans be removed by ordinance? Urban renewal plans can only be removed by ordinance. Or the expiration. Or the t expiration. Now, right. unfortunately, a lot of language in the expiration of urban renewal says for not a period of not more than. They're all different. They're all different. I know the ones we have in, on Harford Road say that they're in effect for a period of not more than 20 years. Right. Or not less than. I'm sorry. Not less than. Not, not less the, than. the expiration language varies across different urban renewal plans. So not less than 20 years could right. be a century. Right, and others have firm expiration dates. Firm so expiration dates. They, they all, they all yeah. sunset yeah. At, at, at some time yeah. certain. Um, uh, they By have, the language in they the They have individual. something in there, and that's separate then. There was a recently enacted state law that deals with the condemnation authority inside right. of URs. That expires if not renewed. But URs have a lot of similar features to PUD and do a lot of land use. These uses permitted, these not. That would be continuing like the regular URs, some not less than 20 years, some on a date certain, some it's not so clear. Are there any areas... I don't know in my district where they have a PUD and urban renewal for the same area? Um, in your district, I don't believe so. There but in are, other parts of the city? There are some in other parts of the city, and typically 
there's language put into the urban renewal plan. I'm looking at Councilman Specter because I know she, there's some in her district right. where there's language in the urban renewal plan that specifically says if there's a PUD within this area, that supersedes. The PUD what supersedes. It, the right. PUD supersedes. And that's been made right. clear in many of the urban renewal plans. I believe in Councilman yeah. Kraft, I think, in yours as well. Well, I'm staying firm with my council colleagues about keeping the PUD a council process. However, urban renewals can well, urban renewals sun, are under, sunset, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. They're, they're a council process, but yeah. under Title just, 13, not, yeah. the, not the zoning code. Yeah. Just, just remember that that's recommendations from oh, I know, yeah. I know, I know. Councilwoman Clark. Yeah. I, I just wanted to clarify one thing that kind of drifted by earlier. I, it's not like a question. I, try, I had a personal experience of trying to introduce an amendment to a PUD, to a PUD. I can promise you that I was told, and there were rules that said, all right, uh, it was about Charles Village. And there was no way I could introduce an amendment to that PUD, the North Charles Village <laughs> PUD, it, unless it was requested by the owner of a property in that PUD. Now, most PUDs have a single owner or partnership. In this PUD, Hopkins owns most everything, but there are people who own properties in that PUD that aren't Hopkins. Yeah, I remember that advice. And I, right. Yeah. So I, I only say that out loud because it is not the case and you were very helpful, and it all worked out. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying, go to legis when you get to the sixth floor, you can't introduce an amendment even, let alone a whole PUD, unless you, you have the request, formal request, of the owner or an owner. And in fact, I have one amendment that I'm putting forward that says that you only, for an amendment, you need only one owner. I mean, you can, one owner within a PUD can request an amendment. Now, someplace there was a misconception tonight, and maybe I misunderstood it, that anyone can introduce, anyone in city council can introduce a PUD. Not true. Right, no, I think, I'm sorry, and I need to clarify if I was wrong, obviously, you're the legislator, so you would introduce any bill, you know, even if it's at the request of someone else. So, mayor, uh, right. But, anyway. but I'm just saying, I can't introduce legislation. The mayor can't. Oh, That's you guys. Um, oh, you mean like. Yeah, right. Okay. I mean, for example, the mean, planning can't mean, come to you and at, and say this will be on your agenda. Right. They have to have a sponsor. Um, and also, I mean, I remember that, and they're all you very know, tricky. That, that Charles hard. Village thing was very tricky, and it totally depends on the land use rights underlying. So it's hard to make a blanket statement. In some areas, there will be only one owner, and that might be different than a multi-owner PUD but, but for the land the use issues. That... And, uh, and I, I understand that, I don't like it, but I understand it, that it's an owner issue about a PUD, because like, oh, you know, like a green, a green what, shopping center, some right. shopping center or something. But basically, I mean, if there's a way that we don't need the owner to request for us to introduce a PUD amendment, I'd be real happy. So Right, and I think it would be do. just, just hard That's to hard. make a blanket statement yeah. because sometimes PUDs have one owner, sometimes they have multiple owners, and sometimes the amendment goes to their underlying property rights, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, so it'd be kind of hard to make yeah, Hillary, a, a we'll blanket work, rule, we'll but we'll work, work with you. We'll okay. work on that in regards to the uh, work session. Yeah, Catherine yeah. Kraft? I'd like to get a little more clarity on this. Sure. Um, and <clears throat> let me use mine from a solitary owner PUD to a, a PUD that becomes multiple owners. So like have, they, they divide the land or they sell to a, they divide the land and sell or something? Right. You have a, so, you have okay. a solitary owner that gets all of the rights that are all over the site. Okay. So the, the site may be 
whatever, X acres, and you may be able to put a million square feet on it. Okay. Okay. And then you get four or five owners on the site. Mm -hmm. Okay. How do you determine what owner gets what amount of square footage? How do you get determine who gets the retail and who gets the residential and who gets the parking and there are two examples in your district that I, I know, know I don't of that are very specific. subject to that. Yeah. And um, they're both drafted differently. Um, so in one planned unit development, um, arguably it's a little bit messier where there were totals of square footage that weren't clearly divided up across the parcels. And in that one, there were some potential problems. In other planned unit developments, again, it's the sort of the nature of the beast. It had much more specific uh, square footage and height limits along the parcels as opposed to numbers that could be spread over. Some are more menus and some are more specific. Right. Um, in the one that was, say, the messier one, for lack of a better word, um, luckily, it resolved itself through various ownerships, but at a point in there, it was a little touchy as to some legal situations because it was, the way it was written, it was kind of like the first guy in could use up all the square footage. Okay, I, I'll talk more offline. Yes, yeah, just. Would that, if it's multiple owners, would that, would it be possible restraint of trade could factor in as an argument? Oh, um, it would depend. I mean, that yeah. might be something that one of their counsel might bring up. I mean, what's tricky is these are essentially very large, treated by the law as like very large conditional uses, right. and you're the body granting them. So you can put lots of different conditions on. And so every one of them is unique and different. Depending on how they're written and worded, that's what you know the lawyers will go fight about in court exactly what was meant and what was you know worded which way and they will argue their due process rights you know i had a land use right that was then arbitrarily taken away so it's just going to totally depend on how it's everyone is drafted courts resolve it um if they can yeah sure i mean they'll make a determination then somebody will appeal i mean yeah you know okay um, it should be also noted that the um one of the reasons we have so many planned unit developments today is because our current code is outdated and so we've needed to it was the only tool available for certain types of creative developments and we would expect under the new mapping with the fresh look that there would be less need for planned unit developments we'll, we'll call that out um thank you uh we have um DPW, yeah. um, health department, no. uh, BDC, no. okay, um, now we'll go, no one else, no other agency wants to testify, or has report, okay, now we'll go on to uh, the other two titles. Okay. Uh, Title 16 is parking, and Title 16 outlines the dimensions, the access, uh, driveways, rules for curb cut, stacking, the surfacing, that sort of thing, all for the, the physical layout of the parking. Um, there is a table in Title 16 that has the number of spaces per land use. If a use is not listed for some reason, then there's no parking required. The next one. Um, Title 16 also provides for an alternative shared parking when it's a mixed use situation, land banking for future parking, and um, some right away bonuses, cross easement so you can park across, you know, sometimes in the back of businesses there's um, some shared parking situations. It also provides for exemptions from off street parking. Um, as written, there are some exemptions in C1 and C1E, also in C5, which is the downtown. And um, the non-residential uses in the RMU, DMU, the beginning, the, the first store or the small square footage in C2. And um, there's some rounding numbers and um, provisions for if a structure is over 50 years old, uh, that it can be exempted from parking uh, with review if the building itself covers the whole site. Next. 
Um, there's also required bicycle parking in this code. Um, it should be noted there's both short-term and long-term bicycle parking. So what that means is short-term is providing parking for the customers, for example, to come to the store, and long-term would be for the residents or the office users, um, whoever sort of lives in that building. And um, that's fine. This, again, a table for the bicycle parking. Also new to this code is required loading. Um, that's not in our current code, and we're recommending that that be added. Next. Um, there are a number of amendments in Title 16. I'm not going to go through every single one, and the parking authority is here. Uh, but the Planning Commission limited the exemption to parking in C1 um, and um, allowed the f only to the first three dwelling units, clarified C5, um, deferred to the manual for um, curb radius and that sort of thing, a few additional exemptions in C2, um, a provision for small apartments to have less parking, and um, we removed the fee in lieu of for parking um, at the parking authority's request uh, because they didn't feel at this time they were really in a position to use that and um, they can go in uh, over that more clearly. Um, we wanted to tie, there's a provision in the existing code that we carried over that provided a reduction in parking for housing authority housing and instead of that we changed it at the commissioner's request to income base verified by the housing commissioner. Uh, recommended amending the TOD or transit oriented development parking to have a range rather than a firm number to give a little flexibility and the parking authority provided us with this updated park share table. This is for mixed uses. Um, Another amendment was to clarify that the minimum dimension of parking spaces could be modified after site plan review. Um, this was a request we got from a number of places to have compact spaces, something our current code does not permit, and um, the engineers felt like they needed to be reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, that parking agreements across property lines need to get tagged to property records. Um, right now, if someone goes to the zoning board and says, I have a 20-year lease to park over there, those things are not um, tagged as clearly as they should be to the records. And so it was recommended that we use the real property, city's real property database um, to keep those records. And um, there was a little piece where the bicycle parking was uh, incorrectly referenced in the TOD title differently, and we recommend deleting that so that it's all in one place in Title 16. Uh, so those are just a sampling of the amendments. Most of the others are technical, um, and somebody's here from the Parking Authority as well on this one. Okay. Uh, thank you. Councilman Kraft, then Councilwoman Clark, then Councilwoman Inspector. Laurie, um, with the TOD. Yes. Okay. So I understand why we would want to do what we want to do in TOD areas, but what happens if there's no T? Um, that's something I think um, hopefully the council will look at that came up at the Planning Commission and was not clearly resolved in terms of the timing between this code and the and the T, as you said, and um, you know we're certainly open to working with you on on some time triggers. Okay. No, I mean that seems appropriate. At, at, uh, the, at drafting, we thought there everything would kind of come together. Right. But there may be many many years between one and the other. Okay. The um and and this is um, on page two sixty eight. This is sixteen four zero seven. On surfacing, um, it says, unless otherwise permitted by this title or in section B or C of this section, parking space must be surfaced and maintained with a dustless all-weather material in accordance with the Baltimore City Building Code. Um, 
you know, we worked real hard on the building code, making sure that we could have uh, permeable surfaces and everything else. And we've been doing this for a number of years. And then you guys come in and say, with a dustless, all-weather material, uh, you know, in accordance with the Baltimore City Building Code. I don't think there's something in the Baltimore City Building Code that says dustless, all-weather materials. And drafting there was, and so if there's been an amendment, we'd be... Well, I'd rather have us just say in accordance with the building code and not have the zoning code dictating what the building code should say. That, that was the intent. That would be fine. Okay. So just in, in sort of as a, um, as a rule of thumb coming across there. Right. Okay. Right. We tried to, to catch those cross-references and miss some of those. So I think that's a good idea. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Clark. Oh. Thank you. Uh, can I... Can I barge in on my colleague for one second. So how do we just resolve that? Are Cross we reference allow, to the building code. Are we going to, I'll use it as one of my questions. Is that a question? Okay. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Are we going to, all right, let me piggyback on what my colleague was just talking about. I've got people that want to build like a little, I don't know, drive into their backyard, whatever. All right, because there's no parking anywhere. All right. Um, and they're not allowed to do anything like what this no. says. Okay. We understand. We're, what I told the uh, what, Councilman so Kraft was, is we would defer to the building code. So we, we, it's, it, it doesn't belong in here. Is right. that what we decided? We, yeah, well, we're saying. comfortable. The, my understanding was this was written to defer to the building code, and we're certainly comfortable with that recommendation. It's too bad in, one, in this case because we could have used it. But they haven't, the building people haven't come up with what they're going to be happy with us to do. It seems to be that that's the place where it's lived. Well, that's so. where it lives, but it's getting old. Um, that gets updated every three years, so. Yeah, we know. Yeah, as opposed to four. All right, so. <laughs> right. All right. Basically. I have a problem with two major, there are two things that give me great grief in, in this. Um, and one is land banking. Um, uh, and the other is, um, what do you call it, in lieu? Yeah. The, the, in lieu. Again, the, the Planning Commission recommended deletion of the fee in lieu. So you're getting rid of both in lieu's, both for bicycles and for cars, in your amendments? Actually, well, as written, I believe the commission only recommended on the cars, but... Um, well, I'm recommending um, that we get rid of the in lieu. In lieu means you have required parking under the code, and you can um, pay... Is that the one where you can pay into a... F no, that's land... Yes. You can pay into a fund instead of providing the parking on site um, up to 20. And I think you can, up in bikes, you can, you, you can the, zone, the planning director can cut off 50% of the required bike parking in a development. And with, with cars, it's 25% of the required cars in a development. If you pay money into a fund that is then dedicated to, I don't know, build it, like parking somewhere. The problem is you, you can't dedicate money in a zoning code. You've got to do it by charter amendment. And secondly, it'll never find its way to whatever. It'll be get lost in some fiscal shuffle. And we won't have adequate parking. So good, I've got an amendment. like plannings and I'm adding an amendment to get rid of in lieu waiver of 60% of required parking by paying in. The other thing is the, the land banking, that's all I've got. I've got more, but I'm not going to talk about more. The other is the land banking idea where you can waive certain you can waive certain parking requirements if the developer sets aside some land on site that later you, he, could he or she could develop for parking, 
but right now it's not. I don't think so. I, I, I think we need to discuss that more, but I have an amendment um, to make that at least a condition, land banking, at least a conditional use that has to at least go to the zoning board and that can't be decided like by the planning director or something, nice guy. But you know, you need a process, a hearing about getting rid of 25% of a development's parking that's required and having some open space with maybe a fountain. I like open space. Okay. Um, at this time, we're, we're joined by Council President Jack Young. Uh, to my right, uh, Councilman Kraft, do you follow up? All right. I don't know whether this was discussed at all, and I say it at the risk of, um, of uh, sort of going contrary to everything that, that I insist upon on developments in my district. Um, but I've been reading some things about it lately, and that is the whole issue of, um, of not res requiring reserve parking at all, and that is um, you know, letting the street be the parking area and developing the, um, for example, we have a building, and we're going to build a apartment building, right? And you don't require any parking in the building. Good. Instead of subsidizing parking, parking by no. I'm not sure that You're that's not. the case. So I'm not sure. I know. I'm this. I'm. I'm just I asking. Not, no. I know it's not the case in the bill. I know it's not the case in the code. I understand that. You missed my preface. You were talking to somebody. Okay. <clears throat> I was asking whether any consideration had been given to that approach. I mean, it's being, it's starting to develop in, they're using it in Cambridge, they're using it in Par Portland, Boston is starting to, to implement reduce the some, parking requirements. to reduce the parking requirements, to reduce, par it ultimately reduces the number of vehicles because when you, when you, the only parking available at all is on street parking, then it reduces the number of vehicles because there's, there literally is no place to park because you're not building any more parking lots and you're not building any more parking spaces. So you really do get rid of vehicles, which is what we, what we need to do. As planners, we, we totally agree with that approach and we recommended that. Um, we got a fair amount of pushback. Um, as you know from the residents in your district, it's always a double-edged sword. Um, and we believe we've hit somewhat of a compromise in this code by not requiring parking downtown at all whatsoever, um, not requiring parking in the C1, the walkable commercial areas, you know, generally. Um, there's a few exceptions that the Planning Commission amended that to. Um, and, but we've still required the one-to-one -one for the residential because we got a lot of concern about changing that. Um, I mean, obviously, there's provisions for variances. We also um, recognize that the historic buildings, the older buildings, can't provide parking. You'd have to tear down the building. So we made a provision for that. But um, this was a, a very um, difficult section to work on because of such conflicting perspectives. And, and you may hear others tonight. No, I understand that. I mean, I don't think there's anybody that demands parking more. There may be people that demand it as much, but I don't think anybody demands it more than the folks in, in my area. Our problem is now that it's not just parking, it's driving. I mean, we not only have, we, we no longer have a place, we can't find a place to park, but even when we find a place to park, we can't drive. Our roads are so congested that you literally can't move. I mean, I have people complaining to me now that when they go to leave in the morning, they can't pull out of their parking space for 10 or 15 minutes and able to get out to go. So, you know, are we looking at, are we taking that into consideration when we're looking at parking? Are we taking traffic flow, mobility, all those into consideration also? Okay. Uh, Councilman Curran and then Councilwoman Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hold on, hold on for one minute. Oh, I'm sorry. C 
Councilwoman Specter, then Councilman. We shuffling the deck, huh? Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know whether you can take into consideration a situation that I'm always dealing with when they make arrangements to have a 20-year lease for parking over there and after one year they don't pay the rent for over there. Um, I don't know how we can get our arms around that. That's a problem. They could get the 20-year lease, but they don't pay for it, and then it goes right. away. We did recommend at the parking authority's advice that those agreements get tagged in real That's property That's what I wonder what tag meant. That's what, so it would say on the real property file for zoning enforcement, for, for anybody They'd getting a permit. They'd have to show a rental, say, a check you know, or something. 20 spaces on this site are dedicated to that site over there. But they, they we, have to the show... The city doesn't and, get into the money side of it. But that's what takes it away. The money side of it takes it away. Right. The parking authority will have to make sure that it's paid, that that, le that, that lease is in good stead. And it's paid for. That's we're, we're the problem I have. We're not, tip, city is not typically privy to those private no, but leases. could the parking authority find a mechanism? I'll let parking authorities To speak. do that. That's what... I, I tell you, they have no problem. Yes, I want to know that when they have 20 spaces over there and a 20-year lease for them, it only lasts for the one year that they pay the rent for that space to the owner of those spaces that are off-premise or not connected to the entity that are paid for extra parking. So are you asking what the parking authority currently has to enforce that or what... Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Melissa Kravchak. I'm from the Parking Authority. I'm a parking planner. Oh, Melissa, we talked to you. We never see you. Um, what, I, what I wanted to make sure is that there be a mechanism that when that parking is accommodating that need and it's a 20-year over there situation, does the Parking Authority have a mechanism to make sure that they, that they stay um, in, in good stead, that the owner of that parking, that available parking is getting paid so that the parking is there for the, to meet the need of the entity. Well, for a current situation like that, as Lori mentioned, that's a, a, a an arrangement between two private parties. So that's not, we don't have a mechanism to oversee that. It, we're never, that's not even part of our, our um, purpose is to oversee such leases. Um, as far as the proposed zoning codes, it's that it, that won't exist. It'll be put into the actual deed, and in simpler terms, that those arrangements are made. It's sort of like the way you um, share a driveway with somebody, and you know you have uh, cumbances or easements in deeds, and so there wouldn't be a need for such a mechanism. I, it's like the BMZA makes conditions to certain situations. Condition on that, they give them the conditional use. Can the parking authority? use that same mechanism so that that 20-year lease is in fact 20 years those those parking spaces that they have arranged to rent are available well basically what you're asking is if we have we in a general sense we don't have enforcement capabilities that's not part of well everybody knows that yeah and but that's when we'll we were formed, we'll we don't. That That's why parking. We have to figure that out because it, it should go away if they don't continue to have those 20 spaces available for meeting the parking need. And I didn't see that accommodated anywhere. And that's when you mentioned parking authority. I thought maybe we should put our heads together. I know the zoning board does these conditional uses, and if you violate it, you lose that conditional use. And that could be the case. We may have to work this out with zoning enforcement. If they can prove that you're in violation with a lease, then that, that would yeah. be We've got, well, that, that's, conditional use. That's a work session uh, result. Uh, Councilman Curran, Councilwoman Middleton, and, and President Jack Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I just want to weigh in. I don't want to cloud issues, but you mentioned that the city doesn't have anything to do with the dollar side of it and that we don't have enforcement ability, terms I just heard. Our good friends from the Department of Finance, and I've spoken to a couple council members today, I haven't spoken to the president yet, 
and I've spoken to Lori this afternoon, the Department of Finance is going out there and charging every business or even residential folks that have parking for three or more on their site or off their site for their customers or for their renters are being charged as a parking facility. $220 fee to register the lot as a parking facility. So churches, 7-Elevens, Advanced Auto Parts, as I talked to Councilman Henry, they're now being charged by finance. They have the enforcement ability to go out there and charge that. And I know the Laurie doesn't want me to work it on the zoning end of it, but I'll be trying to amend the Article 15, subsection 12 parking facilities in the city code. It says a parking lot or outdoor area or space for parking, storage, housing, or keeping of three or more motor vehicles in exchange for a fee, which we know what a parking facility is, but says for other consideration. Finance is saying that other consideration is, I'm going to this rural farm, I'm going to buy some chicken, that's a parking facility, which is charged by that. We will hopefully be able to work with this with the council, but we can't do this in this part of the zoning code to say what a parking facility is. Can we, can we say the zoning code? And what will Trump, would Article 15, Subtitle 12, Trump the transform Baltimore or would transform Baltimore? I know Ms. Rui's jumping right to the bat. It's just a statutory construction thing. So normally each section has the ability, like Article 15 can right. define terms for Article 15. Right. I mean, even a section can define terms for a section. So since this is a new zoning code, they would usually look at your terms here right. as applying to all the zoning code. Right. But if it sheds light on what was intended in another section, it can certainly be helpful. But if parking facility is defined already in Article 15, to change right. it, you'd need to change Article, Article 15. 15. Right. Right. So that actually the only words I need to change is a parking facility is just for a fee versus other consideration. I'm going to go to St. Francis of Assisi Church and I park in our back lot. I'm going to go to confession. Is that the consideration that's considered a parking facility? Right. I mean, I'd have to look at Article 15. <laughs> you want right. to pay to be there. She wants to pay to hear my sins. Right. I like to pay to hear the ones you're going to admit. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So I have to amend the Article 15. Right. Just simply amending the zoning code doesn't necessarily mean that similarly defined terms in the rest of the code mm -hmm. will now be read just like we're reading them in the zoning code. Right. But, but what folks should understand is you're approving how many parking spaces per use. You know, uh, I know you only got a partial list here, you know, carry out two per hundred square, square, thousand square feet, a car wash, two per bay and stuff, that stuff in nature. And it must be 300 types of conditions that are listed here. You only got a couple here because you don't have the space. I don't think that all those businesses understand that finance has the enforcement ability to go out there and charge them at a parking facility when, in fact, it's an accessory use to their business. Yeah, the Maryland law defines what the zoning code mm -hmm. can do in terms of enforcement. The Maryland Land Use Code says, okay, each individual county or city can have this amount of land use power. Right. And so when you're talking about the zoning code, there's a section on enforcement in the new zoning code, the old zoning code. I mean, that's the, that's the universe of enforcement there. Right, that's the enforcement of that, but the enforcement of the fees. Yeah, that would be a different section we'll of the code. We'll attack that. We'll see you Monday on the floor. Okay. Cap Council, thanks, Councilman. Councilwoman Middleton, and then Council President Jack Young and Councilman Kraft. Thank Councilman you. Middleton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know that the Parking Authority is working to, um, I guess, curb the abuse of uh, handicap stickers, tags um, in city parking spaces and the, the length that they're parking in these spaces and so on. Are there any, or is, is there going to be any written provision or change as far as, uh, you know, in the resi in residential parking when they get a certain, in a row house street and they get a certain area where they, the resident buys that space and puts the sign up, is there, are, is there going to be any update or change with that as far as with orange, this is orange street parking? So what's, what you're referring to is a residential reserved handicap parking. That's yes. where a, a homeowner can reserve the space in front of their street due to their, their disability. Correct. Um, 
and there, there really are no plans. It's not something that's addressed in the zoning codes. It's something that's um, addressed in the annotated code of Baltimore. So, and we don't have any plans to to change that. Okay. At and the parking is, authority is planning your. No, it's not a zoning that. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Kath. Uh, Council President uh, Young. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm sorry for being late, so if I sound redundant, um, forgive me. But uh, my concern is about um, prohibiting parking um, lots downtown. At one time, the city um, encouraged uh, developers to um, clear their properties of these, demolish. yeah, demolish these um, uh, buildings that really look bad downtown, and they made surface lots until it was time for them to either develop or um, whatever they wanted to do with them. And um, under this plan, you want to prohibit new ones. Uh, new ones? Okay. Um, Wouldn't so, affect existing, just the new ones. All right, but even with the new ones, um, if there's a building that's in bad shape and they tear it down, I mean, that use would, um, I mean, they could use it for parking because right now in the city of Baltimore, in some of these um, neighborhoods and some of these districts, parking is a big problem. And what happens is when these buildings are, are, are you know, torn down and demolished, people use them for parking. And um, I don't think that we should arbitrarily say no more surface parking um, lots because not only does it pay uh, taxes to the city um, in terms of if they're making a the parking uh, lot there, we get the, you know, residuals from all of that. So I'm a little concerned um, about that. And also, I'm concerned about the council's ability to approve, you know, parking plans. You know, um, I, I, this whole transform Baltimore, and this is just my opinion, it's not the opinion of all the council people, troubles me greatly when I look at some of the provisions that are trying to take the authority away from this council. And like I said earlier during the week, and I want Andy to hear this, um, this bill is not going anywhere until we get some kind of legal representation that can advise this council on some of this stuff that we're discussing here tonight. I think it's only right and only fair that we have some kind of legal, uh, some lawyer that knows zoning code to help us navigate this very difficult um, bill that we have before us. This hasn't been done in 40 years. And we have to do this and we have to get it done correctly. And the only way we can do it correctly if we have experts that are expert in zoning because I'm not. You know, and, and, and most of my colleagues are not. So until we get some kind of legal direction from some legal entity, this bill ain't going nowhere. So I'm just letting you know that up front. Thank you, Mr. President. I think this committee as a whole supports that position. Um, Councilman Kraft. This is a question from Mr. Smolian, and it just is a, a follow-up on that other. It's not as quite as directed, but it is with regard to this issue with the parking um, lots. Uh, We've had a lot of conversations with um, Councilman Cole and I, uh, in particular, with these people who are parking on uh, lots and then charging folks, you know, in condos and um, in my area just this past week for the Fells Point Festival or two weeks ago, um, where people were, or for the uh, running festival, where people just took their lots and turned them into parking lots. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about people that have like a Royal Farm store and where you have to pull up onto the parking lot in order to go into the store and, and buy your gas or buy your milk or whatever, um, or the 7-Eleven or whatever. And the impression that we're getting is that finance is going out there and charging these people a fee for having the parking lot to access their business. Um, you know, you got to fix this. I mean, if one, let's determine whether it's happening, and two, we can't be adding one more fee 
on to our businesses. We just can't be doing it. And so, you know, one, can you determine whether that is in fact, can you come up a minute and can, can you find out what this is, what's happening, if, if, or do you know? office um, I I've just been told about this this issue right before the this this hearing started from Councilman Curran um, we're I'm gonna look into it first thing in the morning um, I'm as troubled by it as as he is um, so we're gonna see if there was a mistake as he knows the funny has brought us other mistakes that the department has made and we've corrected it and if it is a mistake then it will be corrected um, and if it's something that it, uh, you know requires legislative change then we'll you know discuss it from from there. So okay. I mean, but you'll find out what you'll find out what's going on and let us know. Okay, thank you. To, to my colleagues, um, we have uh, it's eight o'clock. We have one hour left, and we have another article to go with, and plus we have public testimony. So Let's try to be um, quick. Title 17 is the signs, and this would be the chapter that tells you, um, defines the terms of signs, the, the design, construction, the size, what type of signs are exempt from the code, prohibited, what falls into temporary. New to this code um, that we wanted to point out is we created uh, two new tools. One is classic signs, and that is for historic signs that don't conform to existing regulations. So they don't become non-conforming. That would be your domino sugar, that sort of thing. And the second is areas of special signage control. That would be the ability for the council to establish a signage overlay in commercial areas that might go with the theme of the district. So we had uh, community people, for example, that said we have an arts theme in this area or whatever, and they wanted to have special signage regulations. So this is just the vessel, the tool for those regulations that could be established as an overlay by the city council. Um, listed are examples of permanent signs, and then there's a chart that tells you what size um, you could put in what situation. Um, there's also design standards in the signage, the, the limitations in there, and um, the next one. Uh, um, there were some amendments um, proffered by the Planning Commission in terms of signage. One was um, to be more consistent on the term electronic and change everything to digital. The text flips back and forth. To limit real estate signs to the first floor, to allow those big P parking access signs to be illuminated, and um, to make clear that um, we, we've made a recommendation in this code that in order to create a digital billboard, those are those light up billboards that the zoning board has been authorizing, that we are, under this code, you would need to remove three existing billboards before you could switch one to digital, and it would have to be in the location of one of those three. So it would never be a new location. Um, we recommended adding language back in that was inadvertently left out about the alcohol advertising provisions from the existing code. Um, and to update this code, uh, this council recently passed legislation on the bike share station and permitting advertising, and that was after this code was drafted, so recommending update that. And also, this is a provision that was brought to us by law um, that to make it clear, as you know, we have a prohibition on new billboards, and the law department felt like we needed a little more clarity in the language to make sure someone couldn't slip a billboard in under a planned unit development or a special district, um, because that wasn't as clear as they wanted it to be in the code. So we recommended adding that in. So when it says no billboards, it really is no billboards. Um, I would like to point out there was some testimony received about alcohol and cigarette advertising, um, and those provisions in this code are identical to the current code. So we did not make changes in that. Okay, C Councilman Kern, and then uh, Council President Jackson. Uh, uh, I'm not going to address the issue of the LED, the wind sail, the A-frames, but I do want to address a sensitive issue on signs, which... My colleagues may not like me bringing up, but how do we address under the code political signs 
because there are restrictions right now. The time restriction has been found to be unconstitutional. Right. But the square footage in residential districts has not been found to be unconstitutional. Do you address political signs in the transfer um, in Baltimore? Yes. Uh, political signs, and Laurie can correct me if I'm wrong, are listed as a type of temporary sign because they're up for the the duration mm -hmm. of the campaign. I think that was what they are. Um, but then they would fall, their height and size would fall under the general height and size requirements for that area. I think that's where we are. And obviously, if uh, uh, you know the Court of Appeals addresses that, we can always modify Well, the it. court case was about the time signs could be up before election. It was right. used to be 45 days, but he ruled that unconstitutional. Right. And obviously, that would govern over anything you decided to pick anyway. I understand, but square right. footage still stands that you, in residential right areas, now you still can't stands because it's a it's no more than 16 square right. feet is that addressed in here Mary Pat? square footage okay. um and i i would just like to point out i am the person from the law department who's worked heavily on the signs right. and i i want to apologize up front to the council i have to leave in by right. 8 30 i have a family emergency okay. i'm dealing with but I want to be clear that my door is open. You can come and talk mm -hmm. to me. And what I found difficult, and I proposed the law department's amendments here, is we're going from a current zoning code where you talk about signs per district, like you're saying, okay, in M1 this is allowed, in M3 this is allowed. This code attempts to do the same thing but make it topical. So it becomes very confusing to go, I'm sorry, back and forth. And so I share whatever concerns you've got there. Um, that becomes really challenging because you're you're just thinking about it not from a zone perspective. You're now thinking it from a topical perspective. All of a sudden, you see all these things about like a frame and temporary, and you have to like think: is that exactly how it was addressed previously? And most of them are. And so the law department amendments were just to try to conform them to what they're currently doing. Um, especially with alcohol and tobacco use, sometimes it got a little lost in translation, it appears. So we're just trying to make it exactly the same as what it is now. Well, I'll um, be with talking to you. I just hope that Please we can keep the restrictions on the square footage of the political signs in residential areas to what right. it is. And right now, the feet. court case, the court has said, look, you know, size is an aesthetic or a traffic issue, and so that's okay. Time is more like a speech right. issue, and that's uh, not so okay. I know that. So yeah. we'll make sure that, you know, again, whatever you, you inadvertently or, or intentionally say there, the Court of Appeals would, would govern anyway. Mr. Mr. President. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a concern about the um, three for one. Um, the council passed um, a billboard tax, and we have to make sure that this is cost neutral because right now, um, to fix a budget gap, we tax billboards. Um, very painful to do, but we did it. So when you're talking about taking down three for one, it ha you have to keep in mind it has to be, you know, cost, you know, neutral. Because there's we an additional fee for the digital, so it should work out. You only get the three for one if the one is digital. It's my understanding, Mr. President, that uh, the fee on the billboards, and, and I could be wrong, but uh, if memory serves, it's $15 per square foot for a digital sign and $5 per square foot. Um, for a okay, stationary long, sign. As long so, as it's cost neutral. Yes, you know. but I, I'll, I'll double check on that for you. Okay. Yeah. All right. And uh, what I want the council uh, members to clearly understand that we're the ones that can make changes to all of this. So we shouldn't be asking. <laughs> we can do it. If it's something that we see that we don't like, we can change it. So we don't have to ask for anything. It's in our court now. Title, I, I don't want to hold Hillary up. Title 17 actually deals with private signs, not the city sign that transportation provides or um, whatever. This is all private signs. Yes, and in, the, want to make that in the current code, there's a little confusion there yes. because there's directional signs and nameplate signs. You can get a little mixed up, but I believe this new Transform Baltimore code is very clear that this would exempt this kind of, you know, right turn only kind of type that, that you transportation know. provides or general right. service provides. Right. 
I, I just want to make a suggestion at the work session that uh, transportation provides those a lot of those signs, and I would rather see a no outlet rather than dead end in anything in Baltimore. <laughs> I just want to uh, make one more comment. We're the City Council of Baltimore, and I know it takes eight votes, but we should not be talking about how many votes it takes if we are the legislative body and we're doing the work of the people who sent us here. And we should make sure that this transformed Baltimore, which have never been done in 40 years, that we take control of this. Because people are going to look at us, not the department heads, not the mayor or anybody else is in our court and they're going to be looking at us. So I don't want to hear about eight votes. We should be able to pass anything that this council want as it relates to this transform Baltimore. And that's we're not the council. Catherine Crayer. This is, this is just a thought for the work session. Um, and this is about the overall signs I'm not a, a big billboard fan overall, but I would like to think about the concept of, and, and I don't know whether it's in our tourist areas or in certain areas, but um, you know, if you go into certain areas of the country, I mean, you look at Times Square, you look at Piccadilly, you look at these other places, you know, there is a, there is a time and a place for good, bright signage. It brings areas alive, it brings people where they want to be. And I think the, we ought to look at um, where we could do that because I think there are places in this city that would benefit by us being able, and I don't know whether it's an overlay, a zone, a permit, but I think we ought to be able to look at that and see where that could be done because I think that, and they, yes, but I think we ought to look at those possibilities. Yeah, and we would certainly, the law department would want to work with you on that because that's certainly been a, you know, one of our, our main concerns, you know, sure. making sure we, if you want a billboard ban that, that stays up in court as it has so far, you want to make sure you do it the right way so that you don't, you know, you don't underline, you know, undermine the reasons for the billboard ban. But obviously you could certainly stand to make a lot of money that way from, from good commercial billboards. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. At this time, we heard, you say you want to at this time, we're going to go forward with uh, public testimony. Uh, Mr. Uh, ben Greenwald. Mr. Ben Greenwald. Yeah. And uh, make sure that you speak directly into the mic. This is being recorded. And remember, uh, you have three minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Reisinger. Uh, I'm Ben Greenwald, president of the Baltimore Parking Association. We represent the majority of parking owners and operators in the city. And we'd like to address some specific concerns as to the Transform Baltimore uh, proposal. Uh, I will submit documents to everyone. Uh, there are three documents that are included. Unfortunately, I don't have the time to go through the technical aspects of it, so we're going to address just the big issues, but in the documents themselves, there's a position paper that documents the importance of continuing the long-standing provision of city council approval for new surface parking lots and the need for flexible design standards. The second is a matrix of specific suggestions to build 120152 by the various titles in the code broken down and the third is a summary of the comments on transform Baltimore which I'll new, use now to just go through the key points uh, and I just might add that I'm joined by by Al Barry who is a planning consultant for our association and Adrian Harpool who's up there who is our executive director uh, Baltimore needs a rezoning and transform Baltimore it's a commendable effort but many of its provisions for off-street parking are unnecessary and even undesirable the benefits of parking should not be overlooked. Over-regulation is not in the best interest of the city. Public parking serves Baltimore residents both directly and indirectly. Not all of Baltimore residents, commuters, and visitors have easy access to mass transit. Over 90% of Baltimore households own cars. 70% of Baltimore workers commute by car. Availability of parking is essential for a competitive central business district. 
Businesses and cultural institutions, especially small ones, rely on public parking. Parking is essential for visitor and tourism markets, drivers of the city's economy. Parking supports transportation alternatives. Taxes largely pay for the circulator bus. Uh, we found out today that 90% uh, of the cost of the circulator is paid for through parking taxes. Parking is a valuable resource source of revenue to the city in the form of the parking taxes, which are 20%, the highest tax industry in the city, real estate taxes, open air, garage license fees, personal property taxes in some, in some instances, and district surcharge. That's five taxes that are associated with parking. Public parking lots should not be prohibited in the downtown district. Parking lots facilitate growth pr by providing an economically viable option for holding property during the process of creating prime development sites. Until market forces align, interim parking is often the only productive use of land. Parking is preferable to no use at all. Vacant land, fire damage property, as, as Council President uh, Young pointed out before, but an outright prohibition prevents the benefits of parking, which are taxes, capital improvements, business support from even being considered. Landscaping standards in Transform Baltimore are too rigid. Alternative compliance lacks specifics. Compliance with city planning's strict standards may be difficult or infeasible because of on-site physical or operational constraints. Every parking lot is different. These are not cookie cutter. Then, then your time is up. If you can, if you could forward us okay. your written testimony, we'd appreciate it. Could I give that to uh, Mr. Banks? Yeah, Antoine's okay. right there. You could give it to him. Great. Okay. Okay. And and we, we we encourage when we have the work session, you'll be notified to make sure okay. to try to be there. I got ninety percent done. That's not so okay. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. We understand your frustration. Um, at this time, uh, Mr. Stanley Fine. Okay. Um, Dr. Shelley uh, Seahart, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Sen Senator, I apologize. That's fine. Good evening. Um, my name is Shelley Senator, and I'm the president of the North Roland Park Association. We're the small community of 154 single family homes, 100% residential, no commercial, no schools, no churches. This is what we are. We're, we're homes. We're at the very top of the city. And today I'd like to just have a word with you about a proposed amendment to the, um, the current zoning plan in Transform Baltimore that concerns the, um, the, these, the change from permitted to, um, ch I'm sorry, the change from conditional to permitted for all our zones for school educational purposes. We're going to be opposing this um, amendment change. We would prefer instead to leave it as conditional. We would like to make sure that in every community, the community and the city council have a voice. We're also interested in making sure that across uh, areas of the city, that there's a cohesive plan in place that takes into account changes in traffic patterning, population centers and movements, and that doesn't happen if, if these changes are never considered at a bigger body such as the city council. We also want to make sure that the city council is aware of the fact that because there is no master plan for traffic for North Baltimore, although Councilwoman Spector has been working strongly with us on this now for two years to try to advocate for this, because we don't have a traffic plan for North Baltimore, <laughs> changing private school usage and taking away the, um, the conditional um, zoning heading would, we believe, compromise our ability to continue to plan for future contingencies in our communities. We have very small streets. We don't have adequate parking on the streets as it is now. Um, all it takes is a few more uh, private school seniors and we have no place to park at all. So, um, and that's even, that's just a minor consideration. Our traffic is out of control in North Baltimore. We are not a part of the Roland Park Civic League. We are a separate community. We've been there a long time, we're historic. And we're interested in making sure that there's a cohesion to all North Baltimore planning for schools and for traffic 
so that every community gets a fair and equal hearing, so every community's schools are getting um, everything that they need. And at the same time, we're not getting buildings we did not plan to get, such as stadiums, large, extremely tall buildings, or buildings that are not going to be used solely for educational purposes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any amendments you have, make sure you uh, give them to uh, Antoine Banks. Thank you. Uh, Joan Floyd. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Joan Floyd, President, Remington Neighborhood Alliance. A uh, couple things tonight. On PUDs, years ago we were told, beware of PUDs, they morph. Uh, Remington is currently experiencing an extremely problematic PUD amendment process, but the current code is not entirely to blame. It's the way the current code is being interpreted and administered that is to blame. But the new code should make the amendment scenario even worse. It should ensure a full review when changes are proposed that will alter the impacts on the neighborhood. The proposed new PUD code does not do this. Uh, 13305 makes final plan approval, takes final plan approval away from the city council altogether and allows the director of planning to decide whether the final plan is in substantial compliance or substantial conformance or is substantially changed or not in accordance or not in conformity or not in compliance, all terms that are in there. And apparently that ambiguous determination is absolute and then once the Planning Commission approves a final plan, it can be changed all over again without the City Council approval if the change is not, quote unquote, significant. And apparently someone in planning gets to make that absolute determination as well. From the point of view of a neighborhood that is going through difficult PUD changes, it is apparent that this title needs a lot of work. It all comes down to due process and we look forward to participating in the work session. One quick comment now, why required considerations and not required findings for approval. Consider that. Um, um, uh, Title 16, quickly on parking. Uh, how practical is it to allow required parking to be 600 feet away from the main use? And why is there a 300 foot distance standard in another section? Uh, the right of way parking bonus at 16503 doesn't sound right. Parking in the public right away is not off street parking. This is about off street parking. Spaces available to the public are not dedicated spaces. Exemptions, no parking requirement for new businesses and row houses and the RMU, no parking requirement for new C1 uses, including taverns and liquor stores, no parking for new businesses in the C2, less than 2,500 square feet, for businesses in residential areas under the neighborhood commercial banner, and no parking requirement for any business in any building that is over 50 years old. These are all question marks. Um, in, uh, as, as regards to signage, if, uh, if the house next door can be converted to business use under the neighborhood commercial banner or some other procedure, signage, frankly, may be the least of our worries. Thank you. Okay, uh, can you supply us with a copy, Joan, and uh, your testimony? And any amendments, you are sending them to Antoine, correct? Okay. Um, Al Berry. Uh, Council Reisker, Al Barry for the Baltimore Development Work Group uh, here tonight. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I'm going to talk about PUDs. Um, I want to say that the Baltimore Development Work Group, for those on the Council who aren't familiar with us, we started in 2008. We're a group of real estate professionals that are proactively try to work with the city on creating a more favorable economic development climate. That means predictability, fairness, and transparency. Um, with respect to PUDs, we've been working for about two or three years with planning department about PUDs. We may disagree about whether PUDs are gonna be used in the future or not. We think they may be more used in the future than they expect, but it will, that'll be determined by what the ultimate uh, PUD process is. We do think that the PUD process that's been proposed is overly complex, perhaps, and maybe not as uh, uh, development and even community friendly as it needs to be. And the major concern we have is that PUDs now enjoy, when they're approved by the council, unless they're amended, and some of you may have an issue with this, they go on indefinitely. 
And frankly, if you think of over the 100 PUDs that have been approved, many of the most successful ones were PUDs that were implemented over many, many years. And the fact is there's a proposal to have these PUDs, unless they get started, within, I think, four years, basically have to go back to the whole process again. We think that's not a wise process for the city to do, and we feel that we need to work a better process out because these are very large process projects. You could have a recession, you could wait three or four years, but the project like Canton Crossing and some others are going forward, and um, they would not be going forward under the rules if, if they were adopted as proposed. So we're here to work with you on that issue alone, along with many others that will be testifying to at the uh, future hearings of the council. If, if you have a copy of your testimony, we'll take it. And any amendments, make sure you give them to Antoine. Yeah, we're going to be we're going to be submitting an entire package okay. of amendments and and commentary uh, at the end of this council hearing yeah. process. As but we'll be at the. At the work session. Many hearings and the work session. Okay, all right. I, I just want to again. I want to clarify that this, the, the, uh, these are recommendations on this report from the from the planning commission and the staff. So it, it's in, it's at the council now. So we're going to have work sessions, and I, and I I agree. And I'll say this quick. I've had a number of PUDs in my district, Salo Point, McHenry Row, um, and the thing is, is Maybe we might have to tweak something here or there, but I don't, I don't think you have to fix something that's already broken. So that's how I feel about it, from my opinion. So um, thank yeah, you. We agree. Thank you, um, John Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two, two points. I've been involved in some major PUDs over the years, and this is a very important decision when a PUD is introduced. It's basically a political decision. It ought to be made by the city council person. The way this uh, Transform Baltimore proposes it, the PUD is first heard by the planning commission. And the developer can come in, put on extensive testimony, all sorts of experts, basically wear out the neighborhood during the planning commission hearings. And then if the planning commission recommends approval, it's almost like it's a done deal at that point. And the city council person hasn't said anything about this. The PUD is oftentimes a very significant increase in density. It's a very significant change in the permitted uses, it's, it's, it's a legislative decision that ought to be made initially by the city council person before there are any hearings held. Apparently, the second point is apparently you, you've already had the hearings on commercial uses. We've written, uh, the Roland Park Civic League and other groups have written about the commercial uses. I just want to picture in your mind Cold Spring Lane, the uh, commercial uses along there. Sure uh, the Eddie's Block, you can picture that. You can picture on Windhurst, that little commercial area. We don't want to reform the world with this. Basically, we want them to stay exactly the way they are now. They're all thriving uses. There's not a vacant building a vacant use down there. There, there. there are parking problems that, that do affect adversely the neighborhood because these developments were not planned with sufficient parking. But we're perfectly willing to live with what's there. We don't want to go for any substantial increase. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Uh, if you have a copy of your testimony, if you can give it to the, the committee, for any amendments you have, make sure you send them to Antoine Banks and try to make the work sessions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Patrick McCon, McCone, I'm sorry. The command. The okay. We have uh, the last one is Ann, Ann McSherry. That'll be the last one to testify. Chris. Chris. What is it? Chris. 
Oh, Chris. Okay, I'm ready, sorry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's and I'm wearing glasses. Go ahead. Patrick. Yeah. Hi, my name is Patrick McMahon. I'm a former member of the Baltimore City Sustainability Commission and worked with the planning department to try and incorporate some of the transportation pieces of the sustainability plan into the Transform Baltimore and wanted to just sort of speak generally in support of uh, a lot of the transportation changes in Chapter 16, um, specifically the elimination of required auto parking in the downtown and C1 districts, um, the parking maximum for TODs, the um, prohibition on surface downtown parking lots, and the bicycle parking changes. Um, I want to take issue with one of the comments that was made earlier. According to census data, one third of Baltimore City households do not have access to a, to a, park, to a privately owned vehicle. Um, we do have a lot of people that are getting around other ways. And I think um, as a number of the council members noted earlier, um, the more parking we have, the more cars we have, the more traffic we have, the more difficult it makes to get around our communities in some ways. Um, I think that one of the points that, that's been made is that for the most part, uh, the, these changes still do allow, still would allow for, for developers to put in additional parking, except for in the TOD districts. Um, it's simply that, that it's not required by, by the, the code, but, but businesses still have an interest in, in meeting their own parking needs, and if they, they find that appropriate, they will do so. Um, on a couple of the pieces that, that Councilman Clark had mentioned earlier, I believe the fee and lieu on, particularly on the bicycle parking, was a, a way to try and provide additional flexibility. If an individual owner wasn't able to put something in, that you could try and do something co on a collective basis. Um, but maybe there's a maybe we need to figure out a way to make that work to to ensure that that would happen. Additionally, on the land banking piece, I think that was in part to address things like. We have at the Waverly Giant where the developer believed they needed a whole lot more parking than anyone else believed they did. They built a whole lot more parking and as a result, and now none of that gets used and a very small portion of that parking lot gets utilized right now. And so you've got a huge parking lot that could be some beneficial use for the communities, but the developer thought that everyone would be driving to that store. We all get there by walking there, taking the bus there, biking there. And he's paying the stormwater management fee for. <laughs> he will, um, but I'd ra I'd rather have I'd rather have a retail use there that, that would benefit. The I got I agree. But thank you very much. Okay. I appreciate you guys having the hearing and and considering these different pieces. Very well. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Very well. And then we'll hear testimony from uh, ending facts from the council people. Comments. Yeah, no, it's After me, Mary Pat. Good evening, Council President, Council Members. Um, we appreciate your time. And I'm sorry, I think I'm about a week late with my comments. Um, but I didn't know no. that. No, no you're, Roland good. Park. you're good. You're <laughs> good. Yeah. Let me introduce myself to those who don't know me. I'm the president of the Roland Park Civic League. And I'm here on behalf of the Roland Park Civic League. I want to agree with what John Murphy said about the zoning, the density in the, um, the village center areas. We really don't want to see any increased density in the village center areas. We'd really like to see it stay at the exact floor area ratio density that it is right now. Also want to agree with what I think is the consensus uh, among you all that PUDs should absolutely start with you. There's just no reason for them to start anywhere else. They are political by nature. Um, but the main reason I'm here tonight is to talk about the requested amendment to the educational zones. We unfortunately didn't know that there was going to be an amendment requested to what had been proposed, so we didn't come to the meeting last week. I found out on Friday about the requested amendment and actually got a copy of Mr. Berry's letter today. Um, which is why I'm here tonight, because Roland Park absolutely does not think it's a good idea to change what was proposed by the Planning Department for Educational Zones. We absolutely think it is a good idea to have any additional land that the schools want to buy and turn into educational institutions be subject to conditional use. As you probably know, we have a lot of schools in Roland Park and in North Baltimore, and we have an awful lot of educational density. And we love our schools. They're great. They're, they're tremendous assets to our community. But they are not neighbors. They are not people that you can go and talk to about what your problems are. And they draw a lot more traffic than our neighbors do. Um, we probably have about 10,000 cars that come in and out of Roland Park every day going to and from the schools. And we don't want any more of the land 
to be turned into educational institutions. And that would happen in R1 zones if the proposed amendment goes through. We want to make sure that if any land is going to be annexed by any of the schools and turned into educational uses, that it has to go to you first. Um, so we would very much oppose that requested amendment on behalf of Mr. Barry's clients, the letter that you all received last week. And I am going to be meeting with our council people next week, so we'll be discussing this further with them, all three of these issues. But they, we certainly have sent in a letter already, but we will be sending in more written testimony to your working groups. Yeah. Thank Council you. Inspector. Chris, I, I know you um, enjoy the private schools. Is there a uh, work group between the community leadership and the schools that used to be in existence? I hope it's been maintained. Well, there was on other issues. Um, we the didn't, lighting and those We didn't know about any of it. We did not know they were going to propose this amendment. We have not heard a word from the schools. And I'm, and I'm sorry about that because Me we have too. worked well with them on everything that's come up that's, recently. That's the missing piece here, Chris. I, I hope that between now and the work sessions that you would use your good office to get in touch with the, you have schools all around. We'll be reaching out to them. I just found that, out about all of this in the last basically 48 hours. Okay, so I, I think that that would really bode well for us resolving the problem. Absolutely, okay. and, and we will reach out to all the schools. And, and then if you would share that with, with, with us, with the Land Use Committee. You bet. And we, you, I know that the chair would send someone to those meetings if you requested it. Council President Young, should I get in touch with somebody in your office when we get something set up then? Carol. Okay, done. I would suggest that. Since we can we give will. you some extra work. Because <laughs> you don't have enough to do already. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Um, now to my colleagues, Councilwoman Clark. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Chairman, thank you for the courtesy again. Um, so I can read into the record the summary of the, um, I guess, 12 pages of amendments that I've prepared on these three titles. I do this for a reason, not because I like to hear the sound of my own voice, but because we've got to be heard audibly in order to make sure that when we're at work session, we can amend. So. Um, under PUD Title 13, I have amendments which clarify introduction and enactment by City Council of PUDs, permit any one owner to request introdu introduction of amendments to existing PUDs, delete Subtitle 3, procedures for plan approval, and figures 13304 and 13305 in their entirety. Um, delete engineering corrections should be handled administratively, recast, minor change, principles and process. I've already mentioned this, whereby the zoning administrator um, uh, decides on minor changes and decides what is and what is not a minor or major amendment to a PUD. Substitute, substitute the zoning administrator for planning uh, as authorized to extend a PUD if subject to termination. So keep it administrative. Add to PUD enforcement tools if people violate conditions of PUD. Add specifically the termination of use and occupancy permits. It's the only thing that's going to work. Fee fines don't count. Off street parking and loading. Make land banking of up to 25% of required parking spaces, spaces a conditional use through the zoning board instead of through site plan review. Site plan review doesn't even let people sit in to watch it. Delete 16-504 fee in lieu of parking reduction and delete 16-706 fee in lieu of short-term bicycle parking. The money goes nowhere, we can't find it when we look for it, and we've shortchanged what this code says is the required parking. So if it's too much, then recommend something lower, but this you can't have it both ways. Delete in entirety the following components of 16-601. Under exemptions from off-street parking requirements, delete. B, zoning district, 
ex exemptions, uh, square footage exemptions, C. D, all commercial district. E, neighborhood commercial district. Those sections. Delete 16705F, which permits director of planning to defer and land, land bank up to 50% of bicycle parking spaces. In 16801 and 802, clarify that commercial and recreational vehicles are restricted on not only in, on properties that are zoned residential, but including the roadbed. So they can't park on residentially zoned streets. This is not a traffic violation with tickets. It would be a zoning violation. Um, and finally, si signs. Delete the exemption of digital billboards from a condition that signs must not distract motorists and pedestrians. In, order, in other words, that should be a consideration when you're deciding on a digital. Add C1 Village Center and DMU to business districts in which internally illuminated box signs are prohibited. I still would like to delete RMU and DMU districts as totally off the wall, but if we're, I don't know what, how that vote's going to go, so I want to keep watching out for the RMUs and DMUs. Finally, reduce almost maximum sizes and height of real estate signs in all districts. Amend to make electronic message signs a conditional, not permitted use through the zoning board in OS, open space, C1, C1E, C1VC, and C2 districts. Finally, combine all residential, all residential districts, not just R1, a to R8, but all the way to R10. Combine them all um, for restrictions in size and height of one, residential identification signs and wall signs. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilwoman, for your summary. I have copies of. Okay, make sure you give them to Antoine Banks. Um, I just want to, as I say in the past hearings, is that if you have any amendments, uh, make sure you send them to Antoine Banks. The info is behind me. And we really look forward, uh, when we do the work sessions, to make sure you can attend the work sessions. It is open to the public. And I just want to end, conclude, well, recess. I don't want to use the word conclude. Recess. This was perfect. Thank you. Um, before you recess, Mr. Chair, I just want to let you know that um, my office um, with Kara um, being the point person for my office, as well as you and uh, Councilman Kraft know, um, is proposing some amendments. And some of the amendments that Councilwoman Clark just talked about, we all need to get together because I think we all are really on the same page so. in terms of some of, some of the amendments. Um, so. Um, as we go towards the work session, we'll, first my office want to meet with each council person to go over the amendments that we have, and then we can incorporate these amendments so that we can have a clean you know, piece of legislation so we can move forward and be on the same page. Okay, thank you. The, the next full hearing on City Council Bill 12-0152 Transform Baltimore zoning will be held on Tuesday, October the 22nd at 6.30 p.m. at the Cristo Ray Jesuit High School, which is located at 420 South Chester Street. Um, and it will be discussing Title IX, row house, and multifamily residential districts uh, will be the topic of that hearing. I want to thank everyone for attending the Land Use and Transportation Committee hearing. And please make sure you check the area around you that you take what your belongings with you. Have a good evening and a safe evening.